eager to hear your thoughts, please welcome Mr. Matan. Don't be so eager. Because here is a group of mostly high-tech oriented people. And here you have in front of you a crusty old man coming from a crusty old industry that has decided to undertake a second career after leaving General Electric into private equity to buy crusty old companies and revitalizing them, talking to you about things. I mean, we should turn out the tables and I think that you should tell me about your word and about digitization. I thank for the very kind introduction and let's overlook all this advisory kind of work because I can tell you one thing, to be an advisor is one of the most frustrating things that can happen. You make an effort, you think, you present, you talk, and nobody cares about it. And that has happened several different times, so let's not overlook this kind of activity. Now, I do have an experience of 40 years with General Electric and two years in private equity. The last 15 years of my GE experience have been particularly dedicated to some that I would call the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the company. And these last two years that I have right now in private equity, I'm really working with a firm that is based in New York and London, but it is a very global firm that intends to globalize even more. So I did not leave this path of globalization, and it is something that I am honestly very passionate, and it is something where I see the value the increased value that we can create through a progress of globalization can be, that needs to be fostered and doesn't need to be slowed down, and we are going to talk about that. So here we are in Budapest, we are in Central Eastern Europe, but I think that it is important, first of all, to see where we are coming from, what has happened. We are coming from, or we are leaving, the aftershocks of the worst economic crisis since 1929. And, you know, in my life, I'm 67 years old, I have seen different cycles of economy. Maybe I've seen them without being part of it or without understanding too much, but having been born in 1949, I have seen the after-war creation of an economy in the 50s and 60s. I have seen the disasters of the 70s, terrible decade with economic uh, difficulties with geopolitical difficulties. I have seen and built up my career in the roaring 80s and 90s, which was a fantastic period of time because of the discovery and the implementation of this new technology that you are living today, which is the digitization. And I've been doing a lot of work, this Minister of Foreign Affairs work, since 2000, 2001, which is a period of time when we are going from one crisis to the other. So I can tell you that I'm no professor, I am no expert, I am no economist or anything like that, but I've seen a lot of stuff and I can share with you the things that I've seen. What do we see? We see a transformation of the world from a bipolar to a multipolar. I'm sure that most of you have read this kind of concept or seen this kind of concept. We used to have a very simple world. It was United States and a group of countries on one side. It was the Soviet Union and a group of other countries on the other side. There was a balance, military, geopolitical, economic balance. The world was in order. You knew the team you were playing with. Some might have liked where they were. Some might not have liked, might not have liked where they were. And I'm particularly talking about Hungary. But on the other side, the game was clear. Then what happens? is the fall of the Berlin Wall. It is the demise of the Soviet Union. It is the Russian evolution into what it is today. And all of a sudden, claiming victory, the United States lost their bearing, didn't know anymore what to do. And here starts the decline, what I define the decline of the United States from a geopolitical point of view, which ultimately will also boil down, and we will talk about it later, from a demise of the demise, sorry, of the economy from an economic point of view. So the US are losing ground. China is growing. You refer to the Xi Jinping speech in Davos. 
it left everybody open mouth because it was the most capitalistic, the most globalized speech that was heard from a Chinese premier, president, prime minister, so on, in a moment when on the other side we hear speeches of containment, building the walls, closing, increasing the barriers, and so on. So all of a sudden China is increasing power, is increasing influence, and let's put it in this way, it gives us hope, which is important. We have seen from the point of view of big hopes in this period of time, the eternal promise of India. India is the second most populated country in the world, soon to be the most populated country in the world. During all my working time, my, uh, my, my period of, uh, as I said before, of this uh, Secretary of State or Minister of Foreign Affairs of the company, I've always been thinking that India was going to blossom at a certain point, thinking that India was going to become this great economic power. India continues to be this promise, and because of the phenomenon of corruption and several parties and political disorganization, it is never materialized in the great potential that it might have. So there are a certain amount of areas in the world that are trying to become the power, try to, but to recreate that bipolarism that used to be, but none of them for the time being has taken that role. And what is happening in Europe? You know, if you think about it, Europe, 450 million people, the richest people in the world as an average, with the most developed and sophisticated industry that there is, let's leave aside the digitization, but for everything else the most sophisticated, could be, could be, if it acts really united as a single unit, the most powerful entity that there is in the world. But we are silly. We don't want to do it. The banking system after the crisis of 2009 is still unsettled. We haven't been able to really straighten up the system. The economy is still weak. Now you in Hungary here are enjoying probably one of the highest economic growth in Europe, but there are countries like my own, Italy, where if we would be 2% growth, we would make jumps as high as this, because for the time being, we are on a flat plateau. We certainly have a lack of coordination between the various countries, lack of coordination demonstrated by all this migration situation that we have experienced, we have experienced, where one country wanted to do, the other country didn't want to do, where there was not a common policy. We have and I'm sorry to say, a lack of leadership, lack of European leadership. We might have several different leaders in each one of the countries, but as far as the totality of the continent, or this entity which is the European Union, we certainly don't have anybody that is capable to take the leadership. We have only one entity that is working, and it is the European Central Bank, where Draghi is masterfully taking the economy with the only tool that he has, which is the monetary, economy, the monetary policy, where Draghi is masterfully taking, using this tool in order to save the euro and to save the economic growth or whatever it is of this economic growth. And this, by the way, open the parenthesis, is a demonstration that when you, create, when you create an entity which is organized, like the European Central Bank, where all the countries basically are participating uh, in choral agreement, that can work. And if we would be able to do this one on a broader spectrum of things, it would be much better. What is happening in Europe? Mass migration from the Middle East. And bear in mind what I tell you, the biggest danger still has to come, and it is going to be the huge migration from Africa, which some of the southern European countries are experiencing already, Spain, a little bit of France, definitely Italy, but that has not reached yet the level that it could reach in the future if the internal economy of Africa is not going to be able to develop itself. Because there is this attraction towards the richer economy compared to the African one, which makes these masses start building up and trying to enter into the continent. And we will see more than that. We do need migration. We were having a discussion before with some of you. We do need migration because Europe is getting older. In a few years, we're going to have less and less people working for more and more people that are not working, people that are retired. 
So we need to have new forces that are coming into the economy, that are entered into the economy. <clears throat> but they need to be forces that are, point number one, willing to work. Point number two, willing to abide to the rules of the countries where they are going. Respecting religion, respecting you know, their proper habits, but making sure that they are integrating into the country where they're living. If you think about one of the big problems that the city of the France has, and in particular the city of Paris, is this problem of the banlieue, which is populated by, the, by a lot of immigrants from North Africa, which have never been integrated. People who are growing up without a job, nothing to do, and here is the seed, here is the cradle for the protest that we see coming up in, in, uh, in Paris and in France, and the beginning of the terrorism that we have seen. Which terrorism, it is one of the other realities we are living with. Europe is a particular target for terrorism. Why? Because of this phenomenon of migration that we have, but also because we do not have a common policy to contrast, to channel, let's use the right word, this immigration. As I said before, some wants, some doesn't, and so on. So what, and also there is one important point, is that we are, military and security speaking, the soft belly of the world. It is easy for anybody to penetrate into Europe. It is easy for anybody to move among the several different countries. And it is easy to commit the acts that we have seen, like for instance, Nice and Berlin in the recent past. What else do we see? This is the consequences of all of this. So the consequences of the banking system that doesn't work, the consequences of the economic crisis, the consequences of terrorism, the, cons the, co the consequences of unbalanced growth, and we see rising nationalism and anti-European feelings. Here we have Alternative für Deutschland in Germany. Here we have Marine Le Pen in France. Here we have Beppe Grillo and Movimento Cinque Stelle in Italy. Here we have Podemos. Here we have Brexit that has happened. You know, it was very interesting because the day of the vote of Brexit, I went to bed considering that Brexit did not pass, and I woke up in the morning seeing that Brexit passed, which shows that the polls don't count anymore. Same thing valid for the Trump selection. We'll talk about Trump a little bit later. While all of this is happening to Europe, our neighborhood are changing their policies. On one side, we have the United States that are retreating. They don't want, under Trump, they don't want to participate in NATO anymore, or they want to have a different kind of NATO where the United States don't pay anymore for the majority of the cost. Um, and on the other side, we have a Russia under Putin that is becoming more and more aggressive. Think about Georgia, think about Crimea, think about Eastern Ukraine. Uh, if Europe is not going to get into a position of substituting what the Americas are not going to do anymore, we will have Putin gobbling up Estonia, Lithuania, Lettonia in one single swoop. Because that is really, I think, and he didn't tell me, but I think, is the intent of Putin, it is to recreate the footprint of the old Soviet Union to make sure that it protects the borders of Mother Russia. And he feels that a strong NATO and countries that are bordering Russia with too much strong attachment to Europe and to the Western world are very dangerous for the stability of Russia. Now, how do we Europeans respond to all of this? Germany, <coughs> I'm an admirer of Merkel. She made some mistakes. But if we look at all what she has done over the period of her chancellorship, she has done a great job, but she's weakening up. She's got a strong alternative for Deutschland coming up. She has got left, getting, not, not the SPD, but the left, uh, the, the Linke, becoming stronger and stronger. So she has to give up a certain amount of things compared to the, to the strategy that she had before. And that basically weakens the Merkel government. In France, I wouldn't say that Hollande is being a very strong president. <coughs> and I think that we have this very strong danger of Marine Le Pen. Now, it was interesting to hear a comment from a French politician I had a chance to talk to, and said, Marine Le Pen has 25% of the votes. And nothing is going to change that. He's not going to get more, he's not going to get less. 
but it all depends on what is going to happen with all the others. If all the others are able to coalesce around one single candidate that is going to be a powerful candidate, Marine Le Pen is not going to win. If the others are not going to be able to coalesce around the candidate, Marine Le Pen is going to win. So that is the danger that we have in France. In Italy, oh my God, in Italy, uh, <coughs> in Italy we have uh, nothing. <laughs> we have a willing government that is basically, that, that has got very limited power. We have a transitional prime minister, the elections are going to come, so we will see what is going to happen. And if by any chance the movement Five Star, Movimento Cinque Stelle is going to win, this is going to be a total disaster. UK, the government has to deal with Brexit. You know, May, Theresa May is coming up with a statement, hard Brexit, now two years is going to be done. Forget it, baby. It's not going to happen in that way. It's going to take a very long period of time because the things that need to be decided, the things that need to be untangled are many. And I think that the Europeans on the other side are going to make a very, very tough road for the UK to get out of the European Union because they need to make an example for anybody else who wants to get out of Europe. So it's going to be expensive for the UK to, to do that. Brussels, we, we don't have a very effective government. We actually don't have a government. We have a bunch of people that are sitting down every once in a while. I lived in Brussels for nine years, and I've been going to these several different public buildings over and over and over to try to get things done. And, and I happen to be also, for a certain period of time, advisor, as I said before to Barroso in a group that was uh, 15 people, mostly in technology, and, and uh, mostly in technology. It was a technology group advisor, a, te a group of technology advisors. And, you know, I can tell you that there is bureaucracy. You know, there, there's no question about it. You need a little bit of bureaucracy because to keep together an entity like a European Union, it is necessary to have systems and processes, so you create a bureaucracy. But I have to say that what I have experienced <laughs> was a very, very strong element of bureaucracy that is, more, that is focusing on some of the details, uh, losing sight of what the big things are. So it's not very effective. And here in the Central Eastern Europe, what we have, we have strong, look at the Poland, Polish government, we have strong nationalistic feelings, sentiments that are coming up that are really undermining the possibility of having everybody together. Now, a few, a few words about UGAD, oh two minutes and 32 seconds. A few words about the, the United States. This new mercantilism of Trump, mercantilism meaning utilizing your economic power for the benefit and isolating your economic power for the benefit of your own country, uh, leaves the power vacuum that we were talking about before and that somebody needs to fill. And that somebody could be China. And in my hope, somebody should be a stronger, more united Europe. You know, Trump, in my mind, doesn't have a strategy. He has a bunch of slogans. He has a lot of insults to people. He specialized in that. He gives a lot of lies, which are defined as alternative facts. Uh, and so for the time being, uh, in the post-election time and in this first uh, half a week of presidency, let me say that I'm not impressed. The fact that I'm not impressed is secondary. The point of the matter is that a lot of people are not impressed. And I think that, and mark my words, I think that Trump could be, for the globe, more dangerous than ISIS. I know it's a big statement, but ISIS is something that is local in a certain area of the world. It's horrible for what is happening. Trump, unfortunately, reaches the whole globe with what he decides to do. If he decides to build walls, a large chunk of the Americas is affected. If he decides to impose tariffs to China or to the BMW and Mercedes, a large chunk of China and a large chunk of Europe is going to be affected. And in the meantime, the large chunk of the United States is going to be affected. So Trump could create an incredible economic damage that I hope is not going to happen, but I'm fearful, fearful is going to happen. It means for Europe that there is going to be, as we said before, a reduction in the transatlantic cooperation. We will have to be stronger by ourselves. We will have to pay more for our defense. There are going to be potential limitation of imports in the United States. Think about the speech that he made about BMW. Or, you know, he's also acting with a certain amount of ignorance because he told 
to the Germans that uh, they should import more American cars in order to get more German cars in the United States. Now, if you have been driving an American car like I happen to do, you realize that one of these cars is never going to fly on the, high, on the autobahn of so Germany, point number one. Point number two, I don't know if Trump realizes that General Motors owns Opel, which is a German producer of cars, and it is owned by the United States. So, you know, there is a lot of that stuff that is brewing that is going on that it doesn't make you feel comfortable about some of the comments and decisions that are going to be, to be taken. And I think a must is going to be to develop stronger ties to China. There is no question about it, because they are going to be powerful. They are going to be probably the next big power in the world. They are the next, but they're going to be the biggest power in the world. And it would be a pity if Europe misses the opportunity to develop the same ties that the United States have with China at this moment, also for us. There is one consideration that I would like to make. It might take me a little bit, uh, a little bit of time. Uh, it is, and I hope you are not going to misunderstand me because this is a delicate concept. I think that the Anglo-Saxon democracy, as it was envisioned in the 18, 19, 18 beginning of the 19th century, very successful in UK and uh, United States, a bit less successful in many other countries, but still very, very good, has run its course. What is happening today, we are bombed by one election after the other. Think about what is happening in Germany, where there is a federal election, then there is one lender, the other lender, the other lender. And each one of these elections is a test for the chancellor. And the, the behavior of the chancellor of the government is always driven by how these elections are going, which is not a way to govern. So this democratic system, in my mind, has run its course. I'm not advocating a, a totalitarian system. I'm not advocating a Putin kind of system. I'm advocating a Chinese system. But there has to be a renewal of what we have today as a democracy, seen in another form, which I do not know, because there are persons that are much smarter than I am that can think about and more prepared in politics than I am that can think about it. But something needs to be done. We need to give it the time to a government to govern for a certain period of time, and then see the results, judge them, and decide if we need to have an alternative to change things, or reward them, renewing the mandate for gover governing. Today, too many governments collapse, too soon, too quickly. I think about my own country, for instance. And we need to stop that. So I don't want you to misunderstand me. I've been speaking about this subject with uh, politicians like Tremonti in Italy and a few others in Europe. And by the way, all of them agree. But nobody has got the guts, shall we say, to bring the issue up to the table because it is extremely delicate and it is extremely difficult. And you can easily and quickly be misunderstood in what you're saying. Now, what should we do as Europeans? I believe we need a stronger central government. And here I'm going totally against what your prime minister says. And it is interesting because I saw your Prime Minister before coming here and I told him, I said, I'm going to say a few concepts that are totally against you. And he said, oh, that's okay, that's fine. I mean, a debate is good. It's good, especially because I'm not a Hungarian, so I can speak freely. <laughs> we need a stronger central government and the states need to give up a certain amount of sovereignty and pass it on to a central government. We need a common security policy, which we don't have. We need a common fiscal and, policy, fiscal and economic policy foreign policy, immigration policy, and we need to invest more in growth and less in control. That famous bureaucracy of Brussels that I was talking about before. Now, all of this is very important, and you might ask yourself, what the hell is it for me? You know, what the hell is it for me in Hungary? What the hell is it for me in technology? Well, Hungary is a part of Europe. I believe it's a good part of Europe. It's so good that I married a Hungarian woman, and my personal assistant and office manager is Hungarian. So I guess that I do believe in Hungary. <laughs> Hungary will prosper because European companies will invest in Hungary, in Hungarian cap manufacturing capability. I remember when I was part of General Electric that we had continuous conversation with several different constituencies here in, in Hungary about new investments. We had some closures, you read them on the, on the papers. 
but it is more the amount that invested and we gave more jobs than we took away jobs from Hungary. What can an isolated Hungary do? Squeeze like the salami in a sandwich between China and the United States. There is absolutely no possibility of prospering and growth. And from a technology point of view, innovation, innovation means free flow of people, innovation means free flow of funds, innovation means free flow of, of ideas. And you can have that <laughs> only when you are part of a very large entity, like it could be you. So going back to Europe, to the cost of Europe, we need more, we don't need less. But there is a mechanism that has to change here in our minds. We will truly be European the day we wake up and we say, and we don't say, oh, I am an Hungarian, Italian, and oh, by the way, I belong to Europe. But we will say, I am a European, and oh, by the way, my roots are in Hungary or Italy. Thank you very much for your attention.